So, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you had a, an enjoyable lunch and that you are ready for the next uh, part of our blueprint presentation. As you heard, uh, I have the task of uh, presenting you with uh, a few different areas, uh, related but not uh, uh, completely the same. So uh, I will try to just uh, take them one by one uh, and, and see where that leads us. The first one uh, is linked to tackling water pollutions. You've heard already this morning several times, and even if you couldn't see all the graphs from the back uh, that uh, Peter Gamelt showed you, uh, you will have seen that uh, when it comes to chemical status, uh, there is actually a difficulty in establishing a clear baseline. We don't really know for about 40% of the water what is the status, and we have already discussed uh, how and why that is a problem. So we have seen that monitoring is insufficient in many member states, and therefore the blueprint has proposed, or is proposing, that we have to enforce better the water framework directive uh, monitoring requirements. So this is a pretty straightforward uh, proposal and uh, probably not coming as a surprise to you. So the Commission intends to continue our enforcement uh, efforts uh, on, on this particular and of course also with the other issues. Secondly, we have seen also in the uh, assessment of the blueprint or leading up to the blueprint that the implementation of some of all the um, directive, um, uh, all the directives um, uh, relevant for the blueprint, the Urban Wastewater Directive, the Nitrates Directive and the Industrial, Industrial Emissions Directive has progressed a lot. But we also see that the absence of full compliance with these directives actually prevents the achievement of the environmental objectives of the Water Framework Directive. Diffuse pollution are um, significant pressures in 38% uh, of the EU water bodies and point source pollutions in 22%. So what we are looking at in the blueprint is to uh, see how we can extend the nitrate vulnerable zones and actually to reinforce the action programs under the nitrate directive. For the urban wastewater treatment directive, we look at our other possibilities. So we would like to see how we can help uh, member states to ensure that there is a, an appropriate long-term investment planning. So that goes both for the EU funds that we spend on uh, implementing um, building wastewater treatment plants, but it also goes for uh, the European investment banks uh, when, when giving loans to, to the countries. So in order to ensure that all of this is happening in the appropriate way, uh, we are going to, um, or countries are going to uh, prepare implementation plans uh, to a greater extent that has been done before. For the industrial emissions, uh, we um, reinforce that the permits are really, uh, really need to be improved in order to take into account the emission limit values, best available technologies, and all the relevant water objectives. Then the third uh, and last slide on water pollution uh, is a number of other things uh, that you will hear comments uh, from, from the speakers in a little while. We have suggested in the blueprint uh, to add the uh, Directive on Sustainable Use of Pesticide to cross-compliance uh, under the cap. Um, we have um, we reinforce that there is a proposal for uh, an Environmental Quality Standards Directive and that uh, the Commission's uh, proposal for amendments uh, should be adopted. This would help strengthen the World Framework Directive role in uh, identifying the and improving monitoring. For pharmaceuticals, uh, we acknowledge, and you have seen maybe in the blueprint, that uh, there's a lot of documentation uh, on that this is an emerging issue. And we have committed in the blueprint to present a report on the pharmaceuticals uh, and their, um, their fate uh, in the environment in uh, 2013. And based on that, we will come up with an assessment of uh, whether amendments to legislation is needed or what, how we can tackle this problem better in the future. Then coming to the second topic on sustainable water infrastructure. We have examined, uh, uh, as part of the preparation for the blueprint, we've examined leakage uh, in a number of case studies, uh, seven uh, across the, the EU member states, and we've seen that the actual leakage rates vary in the case studies that we've seen between 10 and 74 percent. These are, uh, of course, uh, impressive numbers, especially the last one. Um, we have also seen that uh, while we want these numbers to go down uh, across Europe, there is really a need to tackle them on a case-by-case -case basis and to make sure that what we achieve in terms of uh, environmental and economic benefits are actually uh, appropriate uh, compared to the, um, to the problems that we are trying to solve. 
We have looked into a methodology uh, that is called the SELL, Sustainable Economic Level of De Leakage uh, Methodology, uh, and for us that seems to be a promising tool that can help, um, help, help water companies and help uh, in general to assess whether the leakages, uh, how and, and how much the leakages should be um, reduced uh, to, to get to a sustainable level. So we're going to work with the water industry and with all relevant stakeholders to see how we can can further um, develop and uh, integrate this uh, method methodology into, into the work. Then we're also going to uh, work uh, with these stakeholders to see how we can develop a vision for the future of water infrastructure and to see how we can become more resilient and, and adapt to climate change. To just dwell for a little moment on this uh, sustainable economic level of leakage, become very clear in the blueprint um, assessments is that it does not make sense to look at uh, issues such as leakage or, or other issues in isolation. Of course, there is an, a role for the water service providers to operate efficiently, but they can only do so if the water resources are also managed properly at a basin level. So we have to pr protect the water resources and manage them properly at the basin level before we start um, taking uh, steps in individual sectors uh, for, for reduction. So that is leading us to what we've already talked about this morning as well, that we need to understand better at the basin or water body level uh, what the water balances are, and we need to make sure that the allocation mechanisms are, uh, are matching uh, the actual water av availability. And then also the, there is a link to what we heard earlier on the water pricing and the cost recovery. As long as these are not appropriately implemented, uh, it is very difficult to achieve uh, um, incentive to reduce leakages to the level where they need to be. Then coming to the third topic uh, on water reuse, we've said uh, for a long time that um, we should look at demand side measures before uh, increasing uh, water supply. But um, you can see this as a sort of a softening uh, of that position because we have uh, actually assessed uh, in the blueprint preparation a number of different um, uh, alternative water supply options, and we have considered or we have seen that the reuse of water uh, seems to actually have a, or does actually have a lower environmental impact uh, than other alternative water supplies. So uh, we are going to, um, to consider and see how, uh, how we can best possibly, in the best possible way, uh, encourage water reuse at the, uh, at the EU level. We see that there is a lack of common standard, uh, standards, so that needs to be fixed. And we see also um, that there could be potential obstacles to the free movement of, uh, of product, agricultural products related uh, uh, or irrigated with reused waters. So we're going to, to look further into that and, and uh, come up with a proposal for, for how to um, address it further on. So this was the end of my very short presentation uh, and that should leave us uh, a lot of time for discussion. Here are the questions that we have put forward for discussion and I give the word back to our chairman.